Good morning. Welcome to University United Methodist. My name's Emily Clark. This is Kristen Clark. We are, are the worship leaders here. We're so excited to have you here today on this warm and beautiful day, or sunny, at least sunny day. Please rise as you are able as we sing God of Wonders. Then please remain standing as you're able for Lord, I need you.
Um, and you may be seated. Good morning. It is a good morning to arise and come into a place of worship knowing that we are free to do so. Knowing that there is a God that meets us where we are, wherever we are. And there is a God that meets us here to move us closer by the gift of his spirit to become whole with him. So I'm grateful that I get to help move you into those moments of being a little closer. And the first way that I could do that is in the bulletin, and you found a very fat bulletin today, right? And you thought, my goodness, how long is this service going to be? It is a devotional to help you walk through each day of the Lenten journey. Lent begins this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, and at 11.30 in this very place, there will be an Ash Wednesday service. It's not going to be extremely long, but hopefully it will be meaningful as a starting point for you on the Lenten journey, as well as the devotional books to help with you on that journey. As you well know, uh, a week from now, you get to pick up chicken and noodles. That means there's nothing for you to eat for a week until they're ready. So if you haven't ordered, uh, please do so today. That insert is in your bulletin. And then a week from today, they will be ready for you. And on the slides rolling through before the service, you saw one about Easter lilies that that I just can't get my head around that. Maybe I'm slow. You know, Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday, and yet we know (laughs) as the Christian people that Easter will be coming. And so to be adequately prepared, you have in your bulletin a stapled envelope for you to fill in if you want to um, uh, provide a lily or lilies. So please follow those instructions. Let us uh, prepare our hearts and minds as we turn to God in prayer in the beginning of this service. Holy and magnificent God, you are the light of the world. Your radiance dispels the darkness in which we hide. Your majesty stuns us into silence. Your beauty humbles us to our knees. As we behold your glory, all else fades away. That which we thought was so important and so urgent is exposed as and temporal in the light of your eternal love and holiness. Help us in our worship today to see beyond our preconceptions and expectations of a God who wants us to be comfortable and happy. Instead, give us faith to see and worship the Lord of the universe, the creator of all that is, the sustainer of our lives, the Redeemer who reigns in power even now. Amen. I don't know a better way than to begin this Sunday than the powerful hymn, a part of our history. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, would you stand and sing with that kind of affirmation? We will be singing verses 1, 3, and 4.
time for the congregational call to prayer and the pastoral prayer and our Lord's prayer. It's typically in the history of United Methodist worship when the pastor takes all the concerns, all the joys, all the hopes, all the dreams that he or she knows of a congregation and tries to weave those together through the Spirit of God. On this Sunday morning, I want to share with you that, as typical for me, I got, I arrived here shortly after eight, and the phone in my office was ringing, and it was Les Bernstein's daughter to t share with me that he passed from this earthly journey last night at home. We talked a great long time, and um, she will be making her way back at some point this week. And at that point, uh, we'll meet and uh, design what kind of service to celebrate this life well lived. At this point, I can't share with you any other plans. They will be forthcoming and we'll make sure that on the prayer chain that you'll receive those. So as a, a concern, I would hope that you would uh, tenderly hold him and what he has meant to this congregation over the ages, and I say ages, 93, the ages of time. How appropriate to turn our hearts and our eyes upon Jesus now. Would you join? As we come to you in prayer, O oh God, we offer our thanks. You are always present to us, even though there are times when we're not present to you. We thank you that you call us by name, even though there are times when we take your name in vain. We are sorry for the times we've not been present to you and for all the times when we have looked for you in all the wrong places. In these moments of this worship service, we ask that you would instill in us a sensitivity to your presence as we find your glory in the majesty of a sunset and in the smile of a child. We are thankful that we find a human need and can fill it because we know you are there. We offer gratitude for the courage of martyrs 
who continue to confront conflict with nonviolence. And help us likewise to search for options for a better way. Awaken us to the opportunities for ministry, particularly through this congregation as we explore and seek knowledge through lunch and learn, to listen to the voices of others who try to do the best they can, sometimes against overwhelming odds of systems that are more determined to keep them down than raise them up. Inspire us, O oh God, to pray for peace and for healing of our broken world and our broken relationships. And then as you look upon us, expand our horizons that we might know that wherever we are, you are there. For even as we seek you, you have already found us. Help us so to live that when we meet your face, as less has done, that like he heard, we too might hear you say, you are my beloved child. With you, I am well pleased. Such words give us hope substantiate our foundation and give us a vision to continue to see beyond ourselves, to find ways to grow this congregation and be determined always to do your will. This I ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite our ushers to come forward to wait upon us as we have an opportunity to return a portion of what God has provided to us.
please rise as you are able for the singing of the doxology. Christ Jesus, touch us deeply in our worship. Touch and embrace our lives. Move our lives to generosity and service. Strengthen our faith and direct us into ministries and service for those in the great need. Rededicate our lives and bless our gifts. And may our offerings Help to renew your church and meet the urgent needs of the day. Amen. And you may be seated. The scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 28 through 36. And to be perfectly transparent and honest with you, my opinion, my opinion, is that it's one of the most important readings in the story of Jesus and his ministry. Please try to capture that for eight and a half years I went from church to church to church every Sunday and sad to say never out of those years did I ever hear a preacher preach on this scripture I could not help but wonder why not hear these words now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered and his raiment became dazzling white. And behold, two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they wakened, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he said this, a cloud came over, came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found all alone. And they kept silence and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. 
Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Well, Emily and Kristen, that pretty much says it all. Thank you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations that are on the hearts of all of us, O God, be acceptable unto you. For you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. Conspiracy theories have been prevalent for centuries. But in my lifetime, I have not heard or maybe focused on the word conspiracy as much as I have been forced to hear it in the last three and a half years. It's made me wonder, at times, what really is going on. <laughs> I do recall, though, that every so often, it's almost like every 10 to 15 years, somebody comes up with a new conspiracy theory about the death of JFK. 
Someone has a whole new rationale for how it happened. And what I also realize is every time one of these conspiracies come to the forefront, there's always some kind of mysterious, powerful group that is doing the conspiracy. The same way with the Da Vinci Code. That was a great seller. It made somebody a tremendous amount of money primarily based upon conspiracies. And the same with even the 9-11 event that this country went through. Of course, for it, the claims were that 9-11 was totally involved and created by the Jewish people. But all of these plus, ones that you and I continue to hear about, revolve around the belief that powerful people or organizations are secretly manipulating historical events. Most of this is crazy talk. But periodically, periodically we find ourselves drawn to it. There's something within us that tries to make sense of tragic or shocking events. And very often we try to pin blame on a mysterious group of people conspiring to do us harm. There's something about, some of us anyway, that are quick, there's something about us that is quick to make us move into a different world where we are the victim. When something goes wrong, we look for a conspiracy theory to reveal the secrets of powerful, everyday folks that want to take charge. We almost believe that the hidden hand of the puppeteer is everywhere. Someone is out to get us. Of course, it's one thing to see the hidden hand in the assassination of JFK. It's another thing to see the hidden hand in the story of the transfiguration, which I read to you. In today's passage from Luke, we catch sight of something really strange happening, something that is off the charts of reasoning. And if you or I were Peter, James, and John, we'd probably turn around and say something that oftentimes the bishop and cabinet would find ourselves saying, oftentimes, and this was it, based upon human behavior, you can't make up this stuff. It's impossible to make it up. God is orchestrating, though, in this scripture, a shocking event, one that terrifies but also glorifies. It's a divine conspiracy, you could say, collusion, collaboration, but it's a neat story. It's so critical to understand it because this is the moment that has to happen before Jesus can go into the valley of living with the people, healing the people, making others angry, and ultimately ending up in Jerusalem. But the most beautiful part, I think, is the last line. When God's voice is heard again, now, that same voice was heard when Jesus was baptized. Uh-huh. So it's a, a repeat performance, so to speak, by God. And he says in this story, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. 
Maybe that's what captures me to it. Listen to him. Listen to him. We can call this a conspiracy because it involves a powerful force no less than the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, could do. Look at the story, and you can see the hidden hand of God in this story everywhere, which is another reason why I like it. But there is a problem. The word conspiracy today carries a tremendous amount of negative baggage. Yet the word conspiracy is really right in this case. And let me help you understand that. Not that you asked, but you're going to get it. The word conspire literally means, hold on, you have never heard this over any breaking news moment. The word conspire literally means breathing together. Breathing together. When powerful people plan together secretly, they are breathing together. You can just picture them huddling together and plotting away in some undisclosed location. In the same way, when God works with us to advance God's will, we can choose to breathe together with God. The Hebrew word for breath is ruha. R-U-A-H. It means the spirit, the wind. It fills us with life, inspiration, and power, and it gives us the ability to push God's plan into the world. For you see, God does not do God's work alone. Case in point, where are you in the breathing with God? Moses and Elijah were breathing together with God. Peter, John, and James were confused by what they were seeing, but began breathing together with God. But it's more like a gasping of what they were doing than a smooth, easy breathing. Whenever people breathe together with God, they become a part of, hold on now, a part of a divine conspiracy. I want to be a part of a divine conspiracy. So what does it mean for us to be breathing with God today? We're invited into the Lord's conspiracy and challenged to be a part of a network of cells operating all over the world. And within these cells, we breathe with one another, but more importantly, we breathe with God. We allow God's breath, God's ruha, to fill us with life, to inspire us, and to give us the power to push his divine agenda, not mine, not yours, but God's divine agenda. And you might say, well, what is that agenda? Well, you have to go through the journey or walk on the journey through Lent to see what that divine agenda really is. On the mountaintop, the conspiracy is hatched and the plan begins to unfold. The first part of that plan is praying. There's no better way to begin the process of breathing with God than to follow Jesus into the practice of praying. Prayer settles us down and opens us up. It allows us to shed our ambitions and to immerse ourselves into the desires of the Lord. Now this, I firmly believe, prayer doesn't so much change God's mind as it changes our hearts. (laughs) 
It makes us more likely to be co-conspirators with the Lord. Prayer is not about asking for things and getting then what we want. Instead, it's asking for God's presence and getting what we need. It's a big difference. God will bring you along. And maybe the secret heart of all of our prayers is that's what we're actually praying for. The second piece that I think we get from this story is the appearance. Suddenly in the story, Christ's appearance changes. His face is transformed and his clothes become dazzling white. I really thought about putting on my white clergy robe today. And then I thought, no, you'll be confused. One of you might think I've become the Christ. No. No, I have no desire to ever experience a crucifixion. As a sign of his intimacy with God, though, the face of Jesus became radiant. Jesus shines like Moses did. If you know the Old Testament back in Exodus, as Moses was coming down Mount Sinai, he shines with a face that the people are so afraid of they won't even go near him. Once you start breathing with God, your appearance is going to change. This was true for Moses. It was true for Jesus. And it's true for you. When you are in a divine conspiracy, you look, sound, and act like a different person. You offer your enemies a smile. You speak the truth to your neighbors. You live in love as Christ loved you. You act in ways that are kind and tender hearted, forgiving others as Christ has forgiven you. Jesus was resolute in wanting Peter, James, and John to understand that he was going to be leading them and would need them to be transfigured as well. They would need to have an intimacy with God. You see, Jesus was going to set his face toward the cross. And through his death on the cross, he would bring us forgiveness of our sins and allow us to have a celebration on Easter morning. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are breathing and conspiring together about this world-changing plan. And Peter, oh my goodness, I think all of us should, if we're really honest, recognize that we have a middle name in our life somewhere that's Peter. We want to go along. We want to say, yes, I'll follow you. And then like Peter at the last minute, if you know the story, I don't know him. No. When the heat starts coming, Peter has a tendency to disappear. And yet Jesus never gives up on Peter. That's the beauty of it. He says, upon you, Peter, I'll build my church. So there we have it, folks. Bring all the sinners into the church because upon them, the church will be built. Jesus also made the point that if we're going to follow him, we must learn how to breathe with him because we're going to have to go through self-denial. If you're a witness to what Peter was a witness to, you cannot be the same. It's the, not fellowship, but the followship 
You've got to follow and get on board and never, ever give up. Boy, that's the hard part. Never, ever give up. I can't do that. Maybe it's true confession, but I can't do that. Never, ever give up when the people around me don't know how to stick in. Instead, want to bug out. I, I don't know how to explain any other way than to say, this is not my cause. This is the cause of every person who claims to be Christian. That's what fellowship means, not fellowship. God is asking us through this moment to become one with Jesus in all of his teachings. For he's about to change the world. I've thought at times what it would be like as a pastor to bring together, not Peter, James, and John, probably have different names, but to literally sit with those people and say, wow, let's breathe together the breath, the holy breath of God. And not be so much about what are we going to accomplish? Where's the money going to come from to do it? When will it be done? How will it be done? But instead to inhale the holy breath of God so many times prior to surgeries. Over 40 years of ministry, I would meet with the family, the patient, so many times there was a high level of anxiety, and I understand that. And so many times I would say to the person, the patient, and the family if there, join me in praying. The hardest thing to do sometimes is to slow down and breathe the Spirit of God in as deeply as we can. And once you've seen this side of Jesus, you've got to pick up your cross and follow or get out of the way. <laughs> you see, Jesus is a man on a mission and he's not going to hang back and sit around the campfire and continue to sing 27 verses of Kumbaya. It's just not going to happen. Time's wasting. For you, though, the end of the story is different. You see, Peter, James, and John had said to Jesus, let's stay up here. Let's stay where it's safe. Let's stay where nobody else knows us. Let's stay where we can just be with each other because we like each other. And Jesus says, no. Now the time has come to go down the mountain and go to work. But we cannot do that well without breathing with God. You and I have had time to get used to the fact that Jesus is Lord. Perhaps you're still struggling with the significance of his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And now you've heard that God's conspiracy has already begun. And that conspiracy is this to continue to impact human lives and change the course of history. That's you, that's not me. That's all of us, anybody who says, yes, I'm Christian. So at the end of each day, it ought to be, 
how did I live today that somebody would know that I was Christian? Who would ever indict me for being guilty, for being Christian? We have an opportunity to change the course of history. Like those who have gone before us, like those who believed in this congregation, like those who faithfully served, even when they didn't necessarily want to get up and do anything, they did it. They rose to the occasion because they knew that God was calling them to do it. Didn't have anything to do, my friends, with who the pastor was. They come and go in the United Methodist Church. It's the treadmill of life. <laughs> come and go. Didn't have anything to do with how long the sermon was. Didn't have anything to do with who played what music. Didn't have anything to do with the the total of the budget was. It had to do with a call upon the heart. Now, this is true Methodism that I'm sharing with you. The holiness of the heart. Take a deep breath. For only one question remains for each of you to answer. Are you breathing with God? Amen. Please rise as you are able as we sing Shine, Jesus, Shine.
we spent this hour together in the presence of our holy God, as you depart, remember that you are the face of Jesus to everyone you encounter. Live and love as Jesus would. And may the world be changed because they have met Jesus face to face because of your presence. Amen. I would invite you to be seated, please. <clears throat> 